All right, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you will, turn in your Bibles and we'll uh, check that out. I tried to make it through the whole chapter 4 last week and the Lord said, wait a minute, hold on there, didn't quite make it. Um, there's, there's a lot of good stuff here in chapter 4 and so we're going to take a look at the end of chapter 4 starting at verse 32 is where we left off and, uh, and so tonight I've entitled the message, Yahweh is God. And that's kind of the message that's going to come through in the last couple of uh, verses here. You know, it's interesting, when I was going through instructor school in the Navy, they sent me to a school, uh, teach you how to be an instructor, that kind of thing. And one of the first things, and something I always remembered from that, is that they said, whenever you go to teach a class, you always want to come out with a motivational statement. The first thing you do. What's in it for me? This student has to understand. You know, why should I sit here and listen to this guy go on? And why should I take heed to what he's saying? Basically is the idea. And so you'd come out with a motivational statement. And I think that's kind of what we have here tonight. You remember the point that we're at. We're about to read the law for the second time. Uh, the children of Israel have been disobedient. They've been spinning around and out in the, in the wilderness for 40 years and now the descendants are going to go into the land. And before they go into the land, the law will be read one more time. And in chapter 4, Moses is preparing them for just that. Because in chapter 5, we have the Ten Commandments and the law from that point on. And so, uh, what's the motivational statement? Well, I have a couple of motivational statements for you here. A young man out playing basketball in the driveway loses his contact lens. He searches for it. He goes in and he tells mom, I lost my contact lens. I can't find it anywhere. And so mom goes out and does some searching on her own and, and she finds the contact lens. And so the teenager says, how, how did you find it? I searched for it for a long time. How did you find it so quickly? She says, well, we weren't looking for the same thing, she replied. You were looking for a small piece of plastic. I was looking for $150. <laughs> Motivations were a little bit different there. Another one for you. If that one's not good enough, the dentist's office. A dentist tells a story of, of someone who's always late for his dental appointments. And so here comes another appointment for this guy that's always late. The guy calls first, though, and he says, I'll be about 15 minutes late. Would that, that won't be a problem, will it? The dentist replies, no. We just won't have time to give you anesthetic. And, of course, the result is he arrived early. He was properly motivated properly motivated. And that's what we have here in this passage. Moses is properly motivating the children of Israel. He's giving them a reason to pay attention, listen closely to what I'm about to say. It's very important. And that proper motivation here is that the God who gave you these laws 40 years ago, the, the Lord, the one we call Yahweh, the one we call Jehovah, He is God of the heavens and the earth. And that's a pretty good reason to listen to Him. Knowing what he did to your fathers and your grandfathers, letting them just die out there in that wilderness after they were disobedient. That's a pretty good reason to listen to the Lord. I was thinking about it in the, in the respect of, you know, my kids, every once in a while I have to leave my two young boys home alone with their 15-year-old sister. And I, I tell them, now, she's in charge. You listen to everything she, does, she tells you to do and you better behave and, and listen to her. Knowing all the while that, uh, you know, those two boys, they see her as somewhat of an authority, but she's really not the authority. And they don't really respect her as much as they'd say, respect me or mom. And, uh, and often I get the, the phone calls. Dad, they're not listening to anything I tell them to do. You know, the whole thing. Because they don't seriously respect her as the authority. And I think, you know, often in our own lives, you know, that's how we look at the Word of God. We... We don't see the Word of God as the absolute authority in our lives. Well, proper motivation here. What we have in, uh, in verse 39 of this chapter, this is that motivating statement in, in that verse. He says there, Now this day, know this day, and consider it in your heart that the Lord Himself, or Yahweh Himself, is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath, there is no other. Unlike what you knew back in Egypt, there is no other God. There aren't many gods. There aren't gods of the flies. There aren't gods of the cattle. There aren't 
all these crazy gods that the Egyptians came up with. There, there's one God. He created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. And this is the God that is speaking to you right now and there's no other God beside him. And so there's your proper motivation. But then he goes on and he says, you shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, commandments which I command you today that it may go well with you and with your children after you. And so there's that motivation. Therefore, knowing that he is God, knowing that he created the heavens and the earth, knowing all those things, don't you think it's a pretty good idea to listen to him, knowing those things? And so that's what we'll just look at tonight as we finish out the chapter here. <clears throat> In verse 32, he says, For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other, whether any great thing like this has happened or anything like it has been heard. Do any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and, and live? Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Has this ever happened before? It's interesting there. He says in this first verse, verse 32, ask now concerning the past. In the present, right now, you ask the question to yourself. In the, in the verses previous to this, in verse uh, 27, <coughs> he says there that, you know, I know eventually you guys are going to disobey, disobey these commandments and that you're going to go off and, and someday it'll, co it'll come back to your mind. You'll remember what the Lord told you was going to happen if you disobeyed Him. And so the past and the present and the future are all rolled up into what Moses is saying here and what God is saying to the people. In the future, you will disobey and then you'll remember the things that I told you so far back into the past. But ask yourself right now, has anything like this ever happened before in the history of mankind? In the history of mankind, since man was created on the earth, since that day, has God ever pulled a nation out of the midst of another nation and spoken to that nation and made him or that, that nation a special people called to himself as being that special nation? Has anybody, has any nation ever heard God speak in the way that God spoke to you on Mount Sinai 40 years ago? Just ask yourself that question. Ask that question right now. Don't wait for those generations to come when you're in that rebellion. Ask yourself right now, has this ever happened? And of course the answer is no. It's a very special thing that God has done with one nation. Called them out. Taken them out of bondage with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Rescued them set them free as they were captive slaves to another nation, the most mighty nation on the earth at that time. Just reached right in there and yanked them out and said, you're my special people. I'm going to put you in this special land that I've set aside just for you. It's never happened before and it's never happened since. And so it's a very interesting thing that is being said here. They're very special people indeed. They're very special. And he goes on there and he says, out of heaven, in verse 36, he lets you hear his voice that he might instruct you on earth. He showed you his great fire and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he brought you out of Egypt with his presence with his mighty power, driving out from before your, uh, you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in and to give you their land as an inheritance as it is this day. And so, again, a very special thing that God has done with these people. They are very special people, and, and God's been telling them on that all along. Exodus 19, verse 5, he told them, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. 
above all the peoples on the entire earth, you will be a special people. My special treasure, God calls them. He calls them rubies and he calls them special gems and he, he has all kinds of names for them like that because truly they were special to him. For all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy name. And he has called us aside to be holy and to be used by him in a very special way as well. And it's almost as if, as if Peter took this very passage right here in Exodus and, and just applied it straight to us. Through the Holy Spirit, of course. And you see that in 1 Peter 2. You, speaking to Christians, speaking to believers, followers of Jesus Christ, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's us. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to Christians. You also, just as the nation of Israel was called out to be a special group, we as as Christian believers are called out in the very same way, or in a similar way anyway, to where you know we have a special purpose, as the nation of Israel had a special purpose to be a light, to be a beacon for the whole world to see them and want to come and know this God that has blessed them so mightily. And so you and I go out into our world today and we're used uh, in a special way by the Lord as well. And God, you know, He calls out to our heart in the same way. He speaks to us in, in, in a lot of different ways. You see there, you know, He lets you hear His voice. And, you know, God doesn't necessarily light mountaintops on fire anymore and and write on uh, tablets of stone, but he certainly writes on the tablets of our hearts, doesn't he? He certainly does speak to our hearts through his Holy Spirit in a a very special way. You know, the, the children of Israel, you think, wow, man, they had the privilege of seeing these great miracles. Uh, but, you know, we have such a more of a, of a personal relationship with him than they did. Because now he's dwelling inside of us. In their nation, he was dwelling in that temple, in that tent, you know, in a place that, hey, you can't go near there. Don't even go around that tent, man. You just stay away. (coughs) Stay back. Don't touch the mountain. It's holy. You'll die. You go up and touch that mountain or come anywhere near it. It's not a good thing for him. And so, but we have the power of God's Spirit dwelling right within our hearts and leading us and guiding us day by day. And so it's a very special relationship that we have with him as well. I love what is said here in verse 37. We touched on it a little bit last week. Because he loved your fathers. You do a word study in the Bible and you find the word love mentioned leading up until this point, but there's never a time that I know of where it says God loved the people or speaking of God as as his love for them, there are people who love each other and people are supposed to be loving God. But this is really the first time that we find God saying, I loved your fathers. I love them. And that's why I'm doing these things. I have a special place in my heart for your fathers. And as a result, I have a special place in my heart for your descendants or you and, and the descendants that will come after you. You're my special people. And again, we see that there in verse 37. It's a, it's a great thing. And, and it really goes right along with how we understand God in the New Testament. And I, I just see so many parallels here. Here we are, we're about to talk about the Ten Commandments, the law, the law, the law, the law, you know, and, uh, and all that. But leading right up until the law, look at what we're seeing here. God's forgiveness, you see in, in verse um, 31, the Lord your God is merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget you. Forget the covenant with your fathers. Why? Because he loved them. We see leading right up into the point where he's going to talk about the law, God's love, God's mercy. And we're going to talk about God's grace as well tonight. And, you know, it's in keeping with the God we know in the New Testament. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. That's who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so, you know, there is, there, there's not this idea that there are two different gods. The God of the Old Testament, real mean, you know, watch out for him, you got to fear him. Uh, and then the God of the New Testament's a real kind, benevolent God. I, it's the same person. It's the same being. He expresses himself in the same way right up until the point we're talking about the law. And I think we really need to look for that in the Bible and, and not have this double-minded way of thinking about God. God is the same uh, today, yesterday, and forever. Okay, And so it, it's important that we understand Him in that way. God loves the whole world back then to draw out this special nation and provide for them and take care of them so that they can be, be a beacon for the world. But He also loved the whole world to send His only Son so that everyone could believe in Him. This is something that we need to take into our hearts. And again, you see this here in verse 39. Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord Himself, Yahweh Himself, Jehovah, if you like, is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. And you shall therefore keep His statutes and His commandments, which I command you today that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. And so, you see there, it's not only knowing in your mind, he says, know this day. Know this day what's about to be told to you. But he says, consider it in your heart. It's not enough just to have a knowledge of what God requires of us. It's not enough just to have uh, a mental, you know, log uh, logical understanding of what God's laws are and what he requires from us. He says, consider it in your heart. And again, we're leading right up to the law being said. It needs to be in here. It needs to be in here because if it's not in here, if you don't believe in this God and understand him in the way that is being described here, you're not going to even try to keep his laws. If you're just doing it out of fear for him or, or any other reason, you know, there's just a breakdown of what's going on there. You obey him because you've considered in your heart who he is and, and why he's doing these things for you. And you've, you've considered that he is the God of the heavens and the earth and that he is all-powerful and all-knowing but then you've also come to that place of realizing that I love him because he first loved me. I follow him because of his forgiveness, because of his grace, because I want to have that relationship with him. Not because I just fear him. Fear is a, is a, is a reason that we follow him and we obey him, certainly. But in the same way that, that we have the relationship in the New Testament uh, economy, there needs to be a, a considering in the heart. And, and that's why we understand that Abraham, how was Abraham saved? He was saved by virtue of the fact that he believed God. Abraham considered it in his heart. Abraham wasn't saved because he kept the law. The, the law is given much, much later. Abraham was saved because he was a friend of God. He loved God. He had a relationship with God and believed in God enough to say, I don't want to hurt that relationship. I want to follow him because I love him and I, and I, want to, I don't want to um, you know, grieve him because I've been disobedient to him. And so I think there's a, a, a great understanding that we need to have here of, of the law itself. Uh, of course, many people look at the Ten Commandments and the law of God that we're about to go over next week and they say, well, you know, that's what you have to do to be righteous. You know, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. You have to live by the, the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to keep those Ten Commandments. Um, but that is not at all what is being said here. There needs to be an understanding that God wants that relationship with us. And these commandments are, are from the position of God loving us. And he says, I don't want you to make these graven images 
because I'm a jealous God. I love you so much and I don't want you to be worshiping these other gods. As we looked at in the previous weeks, all these things that God is, is steering people away from here in the, in the Ten Commandments, steering away from those false gods, it's for the purpose of His love for them. Not any other reason, really. And so the people need to have this understanding within their hearts, deep within their hearts, as, as we do as well. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we find, if you confess the Lord, uh, with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess it with your mouth, and that's good, and there's a, there's a mental uh, capacity at work there, you know, coming to a place of understanding who God is and, and what Jesus has done for me, and, and I say, yes, I believe that, but believing in my heart, there's a, there's a long distance there. It's only about 18 inches, 12, 18 inches, however tall you are. Uh, but it's really, it can be a distance of eternity. The distance from what's going on in my head, what I believe about God, what I believe about, uh, you know, His salvation and, and His Word and what I really believe in my heart and uh, whether I believe Him with my heart or not or confess Him with my heart or not. He goes on there, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And he goes right along with what Paul has said earlier in the book of Romans, this idea of, of Abraham. He w- it was accounted to him for righteousness because he believed in God, in his heart. He believed in his heart. It wasn't just a mental thing. And so with the heart, one believes unto, unto righteousness. That's where it comes from. I believe in God. Not just believe in Him, because the demons believe in God and they tremble and all that. But, uh, you know, they don't have salvation granted to them because there's no relationship going on there. They were disobedient to the Lord. Uh, we can hold our place there for just a minute and turn over to Isaiah chapter 44. And, you know, I think Isaiah is drawing from the very passage that we're looking at right now, obviously being inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he begins to talk about this idea of there being no other God. God is the only one. Chapter 44, verse 6. It says there, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And so again, we have this this very strong point that is being made here. There is one God. One God that created the heavens and the earth. One God to whom you and I are accountable to. For all of eternity, we will answer to Him and we will answer to Him only. It's appointed for man to live once and then to die and then to be judged for what we have done in this lifetime. And we will either be judged at the great white throne judgment for not accepting Christ, not accepting the penalty that was paid by Jesus Christ for our sins, or we will be judged or awarded at the judgment seat of Christ, standing before Christ, giving an account for what we did with our life after we accepted Jesus as our Savior. But the thing that is being said very strongly here, there's one God. There, there's no other God beside me. There's only one. There's only one. And He's the one that is speaking to these people right now. He's the one that led them out of Egypt. He's the, led, the one that led them out of that bondage and led them into freedom and now wants to lead them into the promised land and re- lead them into a place of rest, lead them into a place of 
of uh, just a paradise, really. A land flowing with milk and honey if they will just trust and believe in him. And so you can go ahead and turn on back over there. There's no other God beside me. He says it twice here in this passage that we're looking at here in Deuteronomy. He said it up in verse 35. Know that the Lord himself, Yahweh himself is God. There is none other beside him. And then we have it here in verse 39 as well. Having that, having said all that, having come to that place of knowing what God requires from us and knowing uh, the, the way to salvation and considering those things in our hearts, coming to that place of repentance, and that is what prolongs our days. That is what gives us eternal life. And I, I just love the pattern that's continued on here as he talks about uh, prolonging your days in, in verse 40. You therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you this day, that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may prolong your days in the land. Because again, he, he refers uh, to the future Back in verses 27, 28, in those verses, he says, you know, eventually you guys will be kicked out of this land as a result of your disobedience. And so consider these things in your heart so that your days here in this land will be prolonged. Teach them to your children. Make sure that generations understand so that you can stay in this land as long as possible and not be kicked out because of your rebellion. Well, Continuing on there, a um, uh, little note from C.H. McIntosh here. The truth of God's word, the glory of his great name, and the love of his heart are all involved in his dealings with the seed of Abraham, his friend. And albeit they have broken the law, dishonored his name, despised his mercy, rejected his prophets, crucified his son, and resisted his spirit, yet... Will he glorify his name, make good his word, and manifest the changeless love of his heart in the future history of his earthly people? And certainly he will. Even to this day, God has not forgotten these people. Even though they were rebellious, even though they did all these things up to the point of crucifying their Savior, crucifying their Messiah, their chosen one, God will still be faithful to honor the covenant that he made with Abraham thousands of years ago in our yet future. And it's really a a beautiful sign of his love for them. You know, his changeless love. It doesn't go away. It doesn't end. Um, He just keeps on going. And so, as we wrap up the chapter here in verse 41... Moses appears to make a a complete right turn and go off into a whole other study. Um, But I really think it's an interesting thing that he says here, the place that he puts it. Verse 41, he says, Then Moses set apart three cities on this side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun, that the manslayer might flee there who kills his neighbor unintentionally, without having hated him in time past, and that by fleeing to one of these cities he might live. Bezer in the wilderness of uh, the plateau for the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Man- uh, Manassites. And so again, he, he goes in a totally different direction here. He begins to talk about the cities of refuge the cities of refuge, and and we'll go into that in a minute, but I really see this as just a a beautiful picture of the grace of God. Again, leading right up until the point we're about to talk about the law, God's grace is already there. God's grace is already there. And so right before he talks about the law, he throws in these three little verses here dealing with the cities of refuge. What are the cities of refuge? Well, they are cities that people were allowed to go to if they had accidentally killed somebody. Out working in the backyard with somebody and you've got a hoe and you're doing something and all of a sudden you accidentally hit somebody in the head and and kill them. So these three cities are placed on the east side of the Jordan River and, uh, and 
people that accidentally slay somebody uh, do a, a manslaughter situation that wasn't intentional. They didn't hate them previously to that point. Uh, it, it was just an accident. But, of course, you know, people are upset. You killed my brother. Man, now I'm going to kill you. And, and, and so they were allowed to go to these cities and they were not allowed to be harmed while they were there in those cities. And so um, we find this uh, back in Numbers. Whoops, I should have read that first. Numbers 35, you shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. He goes on there, he says, these six cities shall be for refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there and, and not be allowed to be hurt by the family of the guy that was accidentally killed. People take the law into their own hands, and we can understand that today. Even though it was an accident, people get upset, they get angry, you know, and they want to exact vengeance uh, for their brother, their father, whoever. And, uh, and so this is just a, a provision to, you know, help that person that's on the run. Uh, to keep them from getting killed as well. But then in that passage, we, we have a distinction between manslaughter and actual murder. And then he goes on and he says there, if, but if he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And of course, the idea is that he struck him in anger. He struck him for the purpose of hurting him. There was a hatred there. There was an anger there. There was a... Uh, premeditated, you know, I'm going to kill you kind of situation. And, uh, and then he should be put to death for that reason. But the manslayer, the unintentional sin of the manslayer uh, was overlooked. And, and I really just see it as a, as a sign of God's grace, you know. Uh, each one of us are, are manslayers to one degree or another, just in our interactions with other human beings. Uh, we may not kill someone, but we certainly... Uh, unintentionally because of our own stupidity and because our, of our own ignorance of God's love and God's grace, you know, we, we uh, have hatreds and we have ill will and feelings towards people that really, um, you know, if we could get away with it, we might do something more about it, you know, is, is one way of looking at it. But the unintentional sin, I was thinking about what Paul said. Paul said, I was... Formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that God's, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And you know, before we come to the Lord, uh, each one of us, we're in that same place. We're insolent. We're, uh, you know, we're slaying people with our words. We're we're uh, very unkind to each other. We're blasphemers. We do all kinds of things because we're doing it ignorantly. We don't realize that we are, you know, uh, really going against God's love and God's grace and going against his will. And, and, uh, and when we have some light given to us that we are really doing those things, we have a, a, a point of either confessing it, yes, I am doing the wrong thing here. I am going against God. I, am, uh, I, I need to confess that sin and repent or I don't care what God says. And it's a deliberate now. It's a deliberate sin. I don't care what God thinks about the way I'm acting. I'm just going to do these things anyway. And there, therefore, it becomes more of an intentional thing. And, uh, and now no forgiveness is, is given because no repentance is seen. And so I was seeing this in the same light, you know, as what Paul says here. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Faith and love that God gave me. He forgave me as I confessed those sins. As I confessed that I was a sinner and that I was going against him and, and, and fighting against what he was trying to do. Obviously, Paul thought in his mind, I'm working for God here. I'm dragging these filthy Christians down and throwing them in jail and having them stoned to death. I'm doing the work of the Lord here. But in actuality, he was absolutely wrong. He was going against God. He was fighting against God to the point where Jesus came to him and said, why are you persecuting me, Paul? And Paul came to that place of repenting. And, you know, uh, I, I think it's kind of the same, you know, as we, again, interact with... It, 
each other prior to coming to the Lord, uh, we think we're just talking to people or, or as we say mean things or do mean things to each other, go against what God's law, the Ten Commandments say and the way that we should be interacting with each other uh, as, as we're doing those things. Uh, we don't think it's any big deal, but we realize we're really fighting against God. We're going against Him. We're persecuting Him, certainly if we're persecuting other Christians. And so I, I just see it as a, as a great um, symbol of, of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy to provide for the manslayer so that he won't be killed in that way. Um, Again, C.H. McIntosh says, here we have a lovely display of the grace of God rising as it ever does above human weakness and failure. God, in his abounding grace, would not leave the poor slayer without a refuge in the day of his distress. If man cannot come up to the height of God's thoughts, God can come down to the depths of man's need. How unlike the manner of man. How far above mere law or legal righteousness. Law might speak thus, but grace spoke differently. And certainly grace does have a a totally different uh, way of acting upon man's feebleness, upon our rebellion, upon our, our, our human nature. God's grace, when we turn to him and we confess those things, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to uh, restore us. That's God's grace. Unmerited. Romans 5.20, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. He goes on and finishes there in verse 21, so that as sin re- uh, reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where the law came in, the law is is there for the purpose of showing us that we are sinners. Where the law entered that offenses might abound is the idea of once you know the law, once you see that sign, speed limit 55 miles an hour, and then you look down, ooh, sin is abounding. (laughs) You're seeing you're going 65 you know, and now you know I am breaking the law. I am breaking the law. And that's the purpose of the law. The, br- the law brings you to that place of realizing that you're a lawbreaker. It's not there to show you how righteous you are. Oh, I can keep the law. I can keep the law. Look how righteous I am. I'm self-righteous because I'm doing all these things. No, it's to show you that you can't keep it, that you are not righteous before the Lord and that you need to come to a place of repentance. And that's the whole purpose for the law. And so even as that sin abounds though, and it reigns to the point of death, grace abounds even more. And that's the idea that we never need to, never should forget about the Lord. His grace is abounding to us. No matter how bad you think you are, no matter how much sin is abounding in your life, when you confess that sin to the Lord and accept what He has done on your behalf for that sin, His grace abounds in your life even more to the point of righteousness and eternal life. Well, we're just going to finish up the last couple of verses here in which Moses will just... It, it's almost like verse 44 through 49 should be a part of chapter 5 and they really should have moved that into chapter 5, I think because it just starts to talk about the law at this point. And so he says, Now this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments which Moses spoke to the children of Israel after they came out of Egypt. On this side of the Jordan, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon, whom Moses and the children of Israel defeated after they came out of Egypt. And they took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of Bashan, two kings of the Amorites who were on this side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun. From uh, Ar- Ar- that place, wherever that is, uh, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, even to Mount Sion, that is Hermon, and on the plain on the east side of the Jordan as far as the Sea of Arabah, 
below the slopes of Pisgah. And so he's just describing where the law is being given and at, at what point it's being given after they had fought the battles right there on the, on the banks of the Jordan River. And so as we get into chapter 5 again, he'll begin to give the Ten Commandments and the subsequent uh, laws and statutes after that. But again, as we, uh, as we close here tonight, consider what Moses is telling his people at this time. Yahweh, Jehovah, the God that you and I worship, he is God. He's the one, true, living, all-powerful God. There is no other God. And he is the one that we will give an account to as our lives will eventually come to an end. And, uh, you know, again, that motivation, the idea of why should I listen to God? Why should I follow God? Why should I, you know, spend time in his word? Why should I spend time on my knees? Uh, it's, it's the same purpose. Know this day. Consider in your heart. Uh, remember, ask now concerning the things that have happened in the past. Bring these things to your mind and really consider who God is, how powerful he is. And consider the fact that he loves you. He loves you. He doesn't desire that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's a loving, caring God, and he wants to have a relationship with each one of us. And so I just encourage you to, uh, to seek that out. Consider that in your heart here tonight. Consider his grace. Consider his mercy. And uh, consider your relationship with him tonight as we just stand and worship the Lord one last time. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, that we, we can't do anything to deserve it no matter how hard we try to keep your law and to attain our own righteousness, Lord, we fall so miserably short, it's, it's not even worth accounting for it. And so, Father, tonight we ask that you would just pour out your grace upon us, Lord, in those areas of our lives where we see sin abounding. Father, we confess those things to you. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. Lord, that you would restore our relationship to you if it has weakened or has gone astray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would just pour out in, in a greater measure, Lord, your spirit in our lives so that we may be strengthened in our abilities to combat sin in our lives and, and just walk holy before you. And Lord, we need your strength. We can't do it on our own. We confess that. Our spirits are willing, but our flesh is so weak. Father, we need you. So we thank you for these things tonight, Lord. We thank you uh, for the examples that you've given us in your word, the reasons that we should follow after you and obey you. Father, we put you on that throne here tonight. We acknowledge that you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. There's none beside you, Father, and we... We enthrone you in that place in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.